Welcome to the Jenna Ellis Show, sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. There has never been a better time to invest in precious metals. Visit LegacyPMInvestments.com. That's LegacyPMInvestments.com. Good evening and welcome to Jenna Ellis tonight. So late last night, the NTSB chair, Jennifer Homedy and a few other uh, high ranking officials in the NTSB held a press conference to uh, relay to the media what the investigation, the ongoing investigation contains thus far in the Key Bridge disaster. So here's just a little bit from that press conference. Two pilots for a total of 23 individuals uh, on board the vessel at the time of the accident. They also were able to obtain the cargo manifest. Now, the cargo manifest fest, we did bring in uh, one of NTSB's senior hazmat investigators today to begin to look at the cargo and the cargo manifest. Uh, he was able to identify 56 containers of hazardous materials. Uh, that's 764 tons of hazardous materials, mostly corrosives, flammables, uh, and some miscellaneous hazardous materials, class nine hazardous materials, which uh, would include lithium ion batteries. Some of the hazmat containers were breached. Uh, we have seen uh, shear on, or sheen, sorry, sheen on the um, waterway. The federal, state, and local authorities are aware of that, and they will uh, be in charge of addressing those issues. Joining me now is retired Naval Commander Ray Alexander. And uh, Ray, this, to me as a layperson, this seems really concerning that you have this much hazardous material that um, now reports are saying is actually leaking into the uh, Baltimore Harbor. So um, first, let's start there. Is that a concern? Yeah, absolutely. It's a concern. Um, my understanding is that this is a containerized vessel and not a bulk shipping vessel. So a lot of that material fortunately fortunately should be containerized, although there may be leaking from the containers. Um, it is definitely a cause for concern. Yeah, and, and uh, the NTSB chair did say that some of the containers were breached. Um, does that mean that they're leaking from the containers and that was likely caused by the accident? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they're gonna implement, if they haven't already, spill containment for any of the any of the hazardous chemicals that might have been been uh, uh, leaked into the waters there in Baltimore Harbor, uh, the concern being that that'll capture any of the uh, hazardous material that might float on the surface. Uh, there may be hazardous material that's more dense than water, though, that will go to the bottom uh, and be very very difficult to capture. Based be now released into the environment. Yeah, and so the NTSB is saying that their initial report will take about two to four weeks to complete. They've released photos um, as of earlier today of some of their interviews and some uh, some of that footage as well. But going back to uh, the actual incident and this accident, um, one of the questions that I had again, just you know, as a as a layperson, um, they did have about five minutes before that initial mayday call from uh, the cargo ship. Uh, to the point of impact. And um, the reports have said that the Maryland police were able to stop traffic on the bridge. But now we also have learned that there were um, several construction workers, I think as many as eight, that were filling potholes. Um, this bridge is about 1.6 miles long. So even if they were right in the middle, you know, they would have still had time, you, know, you would think, um, to have a radio or something to say, you know, jump in your vehicle, get to safety. Um, why, why was that not done? Well, I, <clears throat> my understanding of the timeline is that they had approximately three minutes from the point of the May Day call, which would be made from the vessel to the port authority or to the harbor control. And then they would have had to have relayed that call to say 911 dispatch center or directly to the, to the police. When that timeline, even a five minute timeline, that's still from the point of recognition of the power outage and the potential casualty, five minutes is still 
a very short period of time to relay that information through the emergency systems, emergency communications networks um, for a vessel to uh, police authorities to relay that message to those workers on the bridge. I actually think that um, my personal assessment is that with a five to three minute window to communicate that they uh, did a tremendous, uh, the police department there did a tremendous job to stop traffic. Uh, my understanding of what happened is that they were able to stop traffic and prevent more casualties. Yeah, and I'm so grateful that, you know, this wasn't during the middle of the day or rush hour, um, you know, as, as horrific as this accident is, it could have been far worse. And so, you know, with that initial report that we are expecting in that two to four week timeline that the NTSB chair mentioned, um, what types of recommendations generally should come from this? I mean, will there be uh, protocol assessments and something that, you know, and this timeline of maybe how this could have been prevented or what should we anticipate uh, will be contained there. Yeah, so some of the details that I'm looking for from that NTSB analysis are um, what was the condition of the vessel before it left port? Uh, my understanding is that there were some known electrical issues with the vessel. Um, why those electrical issues uh, didn't cause other types of mitigation, didn't cause the vessel ownership to ask for additional mitigation. Um, for your audience's general awareness, Navigation into and out of uh, commercial shipping ports is some of the most risky um, operations that these vessels will face. Um, there are a bunch of different factors that make it risky besides the obvious like um, uh, restrictions like bridges, uh, shoal water or shallowing waters, uh, you know, and needing to confine your, op your vessel to a specific channel. Uh, you are operating at low speeds, which um, uh, might not be self-evident to the average car driver, but at, at low speeds, vessels um, maneuvering aircraft or um, or ships maneuvering at low speed actually have less control because their control surfaces are less effective at maneuvering the vessel. Uh, so low speed operations with such a large vessel tend to be some of the most risky, um, which is why they try to mitigate that risk through the use of tugs, um, one of the other issues that this NTSB investigation, I hope, will address is why, with these known electrical issues, uh, they didn't tug support all the way through the bridge, all the way under the bridge and out into open water. Uh, you can mm -hmm. request tug support. Tug, tugs are typically used to pull vessels like this off the pier. Mm -hmm. um, you can see, watch any pier operation, and you'll see tugs operating in and out of the harbor. Well, Ray Alexander, we got to leave it there, but thank you so much for your expertise. Still a lot of pending questions uh, with that NTSB report coming soon. We'll be right back with more here on Jenna Ellis tonight. Throughout history, there are clear moments that define our nation's path. And now you can own a piece of that history. I'm thrilled to announce the official Newt Gingrich contract with America Coin from our friends at Legacy Precious Metals in partnership with Speaker Gingrich. This limited edition one ounce 99.99% silver coin commemorates the historic victory in 1994 when the Republican Party under Speaker Gingrich's guidance took control of Congress. The Newt Gingrich contract with America Coin also symbolizes the transformative political platform that led to the landmark achievements like the overhaul of the U.S. welfare system and the Balanced Budget Act. This is a limited edition coin that will sell out. So whether you're looking for the perfect gift or you want to own a piece of history, act fast before they run out. The Newt Gingrich contract with America coin is more than an investment. It's a tribute to honest government and America. You can order it online at NewtGingrichSilverCoin.com. That's NewtGingrichSilverCoin.com and use promo code Jenna, that's J-E-N-N-A, to get $10 off your purchase. Go to NewtGingrichSilverCoin.com now. Well, now it's time for everybody's favorite Thursday segments, the Thursday Roundup.
Joining this week's power panel is Robin Biro, who is a Democrat strategist. And then we have two GOP strategists, Matt Tiermand and also uh, Carly Atchison. And Matt is also a Claremont Institute fellow. I uh, definitely want to put that one in there. So panel, thanks so much for joining today. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Great to be here. Thanks. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get to the first topic. Uh, Governor DeSantis keeps killing it for conservative priorities in the state of Florida. Uh, he won the Disney versus DeSantis lawsuit uh, that has been kind of a controversy over the last several years, much to the chagrin of uh, many lawyers, even me included. I really didn't think he was going to win this one, but he did. And then also uh, the squatters rights or so-called rights issues. Um, he has now signed that legislation that basically says that squatters have no rights in protecting the real property rights of Floridians. So he addressed that yesterday at a press conference, but listen to what he said about the Disney debacle. Disney settlement. Disney. So we've always acted with all the Disney issues, parents' rights in education, uh, replacing uh, Reedy Creek and making sure that was a state control board, uh, doing the, you know, nullifying these covenants at the 11th hour. Everything we've done has been in the best interest of the state of Florida. And, and we have been vindicated on all those actions uh, going forward. We're going to continue to govern with the best interests of the state of Florida. So, so I'm glad that they were able to do that, that settlement. Um, those, those 11th hour covenants and restrictions were, were never going to be valid. We knew that. Uh, the, 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 the challenge to the state oversight board to replace Reedy Creek, that's not going anywhere. Obviously, that was dismissed in district court. So we have uh, an interest as a state um, in moving forward to make this region very strong. This oversight tourism oversight board and that district is a big part of that. And, uh, and I think that there's going to be ways where, uh, you know, we can do things that are in the best interest of the state of Florida. Um, and I think Disney can be a part of that. I mean, certainly you look at Universal, they're doing the epic universe. That's going to be a huge, huge game changer for this region. I got to think Disney would have an interest in maybe, maybe offering uh, another one. The district will be ready to, to negotiate uh, something to be able to be good for the state of Florida, be good for jobs, and be good for all those things. But you know, I would just point out, a year ago, people were trying to act like that all these legal maneuverings were all going, going to succeed against the state of Florida. And the reality is here we are a year later and not one of them has succeeded. Every action that we've taken uh, has been upheld in full and the state's better off for it. All right, so taking that victory lap, Carly, we'll come to you first because you worked on Governor DeSantis's campaign. Uh, what are your thoughts here? Well, first of all, this is just another example of Ron DeSantis doing what he does best, which is delivering results for the people who he serves. Um, obviously, this is a great thing for all parties involved. I think it sets a new precedent as well uh, for governors across the country that corporations have to abide by the same rules as everybody else. There's no such thing as a special carve out. Lobbyists do not rule the state capital. The people rule the state capital. Uh, I ultimately think this is a good thing and serves as a warning sign for other corporations who might be wondering if they should get involved and make a political statement. Uh, don't, because now this is the new precedent that you will lose that battle as you should. The last thing I want to say is this all started with Disney. Uh, I think the media likes to take it to Ron DeSantis as if he somehow started this fight. He didn't. Disney stepped in it when they said that uh, porn should be allowed in schools and parents' rights just need to kind of go by the wayside. And that's what prompted DeSantis to say, hey, no, and also you have to abide by the same rules as everybody else. Ultimately, I think this is a good thing. Yeah. So, Matt, we'll go to you uh, next. So, uh, Governor DeSantis's press secretary, Jeremy Redfern, uh, came out with a tweet and said that the mainstream media should uh, apologize and, and, and really the malpractice there with all of these articles over the last several years uh, kind of condemning and making fun of DeSantis ultimately didn't pan out here. Yeah, correct. I mean, Babylon B had a, uh, a great meme 
that said DeSantis should get kicked out of the GOP because he's such an anomaly, doesn't fit the mold. He gets things done. He actually wins on behalf of his constituents and the mandate that he's given, which was, as we saw a couple years ago, overwhelming cycle over cycle as he's flipped this state from a purple swing state to red. Uh, you know, don't forget that Disney stepped in it on the political debate when they joined the mainstream media in attacking him over the Don't Say Gay bill, where they conflated what was really in the contents of the bill to levy a hard left political attack. And so it was totally reasonable to look at them playing politics when they've gotten this decades old carve out exemption on taxation, which is totally anachronistic, totally out of line with the times in corporate boondoggles. Uh, and so he said, you know what, let's reevaluate this 100% correct in doing so on behalf of the constituents from economic policy, politics, every aspect. And then look, now he pivots and says, okay, they can still be a good corporate citizen. They they don't have to move to South Carolina, as Nikki Haley uh, generously uh, invited Disney to do so, which is obviously ridiculous given their uh, having built Orlando and the size of their footprint. And he said, look, they will create jobs. They will do more programs, but we have to evaluate what it is they're getting on the back of the taxpayer. Big win for him. Big win. Yeah, and I actually thought, Matt, to your point, that it was um, very generous of Governor DeSantis to, to say, hey, you know, we look forward to working with Disney. He didn't come out and do this kind of victory lap and, and sort of um, squish them or condemn them or kind of egg on this fight. He said, you know, hey, we, we won this, we're moving forward, and hey, maybe Disney's going to build a fifth park. So, uh, Robin, let's get you in the conversation as the only non-Floridian. Doesn't this make you want to come and move to the free state of Florida? Jen. Jenna, my kids and I are coming for spring break next week. So, uh, and look, we're Excellent. we're actually annual pass holders at Disney. Yeah. We're we're annual Great. pass holders at Disney. Uh, but look, I want to say that Disney is not Vatican City. They still have to abide by the rules of st of the state of Florida. And uh, I'm a Democrat, but I firmly believe in states' rights. And the state of Florida does have a right to govern as they see fit. Uh, I just want to point out to the viewers that Ron DeSantis actually offered Disney to just drop all of this, uh, cut, stop the lawsuit, stop all of this. It was Disney that insisted that they continue and carry forward. So they are out probably millions of dollars of legal fees by that decision, and they lost. And frankly, I guess they deserve to lose. Yeah, not so Magic Kingdom, but you know, hey, I'm an annual pass holder at Disney as well, so maybe I will see you next week for spring break. Uh, but glad that we're kind of <laughs> uh, setting these differences aside and everybody can be happy again in Florida and this great tourism. So uh, we'll see you on the flip side of the break with the Power Panel for our next topic on Thursday's Roundup. As you know, my friend Mike Lindell has a passion to help everyone get the best sleep of their life. He didn't stop by simply creating the best pillow. Mike created the Giza Dream bed sheets. They look and feel great, which means an even better night's sleep for me, which is crucial for my busy schedule. Mike found the world's best cotton. It is ultra soft and breathable, but extremely durable. Mike's Giza sheets come with a 60-day money-back guarantee and a 10-year warranty. The Giza Dream Sheets come in a variety of sizes and colors. Mike's latest incredible deal is the sale of the year. For a limited time, you will receive 50% off the Giza Dream Sheets. You will also receive a set for as low as $29.98. So go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio podcast square, and use the promo code Jenna. There you will find not only this amazing offer, but also deep discounts on all MyPillow products, including the MyPillow 2.0 mattress topper, which I have and I love, the MyPillow kitchen towel sets, and now even flannel sheets and so much more. We definitely need flannel sheets for as crazy as all of this weather has been lately. So go to MyPillow.com and make sure you use the promo code Jenna or call 1-800-564-564. 8475. That's 1 800 564 8475 and use the promo code Jenna. And we are back with this week's power panel Robin Byro, Matt Tierman, and Carly Atchison. And uh, the next topic, Veep Steak. So RFK Jr. announced his vice presidential running mate this week, Nicole Shanahan. This is what he had to say in her introduction. Until the last American child gets to live a healthy life, 
and to pursue their own happiness in the land of the free until the last censor is gone from our government. I'm, I'm confident that there is no American more qualified than Nicole Shanahan to play this role. So I'm proud to introduce to all of you the next Vice President of the United States of America, Nicole Shanahan. Thank you all very much. All right, Matt, let's come to you first. So I thought this was a terrible pick for RFK, who has cast himself as an independent and a contrast between the Trump versus Biden rematch. And with this pick of a really extreme leftist, uh, doesn't this cast him as a progressive Democrat? I mean, what's the difference now between voting for his ticket versus Biden's? Uh, yeah, no, it is absolutely terrible. I know RFK, and I liked watching his campaign. I know people close to him, including in his family, and we've talked about how he has potential to, look, he's not going to win. She's not the next vice president. He's not the next president. But much like Ross Perot uh, 25, 30 years ago, there was a new debate that was framed by having somebody relatively independent. We didn't even know who are they going to take more votes from. Are they going to be spoilers for the Republican right in Trump or the Democratic left in Biden or whoever they replace Biden with? Now it's very, very clear it is a facsimile of the progressive left campaigning. She's a horrible pick, but I know why he picked her. Money. Uh, they need access to that uh, Sergey Brin divorce settlement uh, fortune because he doesn't have enough to get on enough state ballots. Uh, there has to be a, you know, a, a run, a big race to get on these state ballots over the next uh, two to three months. And that needs finances. And she has it. Uh, they agree on some stuff on pharma. But, you know, where he was really good and he made uh, lefty heads explode is he's a constitutionalist in conversations with him. He is very married to the First and Second Amendment and the rest of the bill rights. Now, this is going to look like a, you know, a run-of-the-mill, progressive Elizabeth Warren-style Dem campaign, and it's going to fade into oblivion and nothingness. So the opportunity to uh, to make some noise in the debate and actually galvanize some, some actual debate and change in politics, it's gone. What a waste. Yeah, what, what a waste indeed. But uh, Robin, Matt raises a really good point that likely now um, anyone who is a disaffected Democrat from Biden may now consider RFK not quite so uh, conservative, moderate, independent. Are you concerned as the Democrat here in our panel that this is going to take away from uh, Biden's votes and we may end up with Trump again? Perhaps. I, I still think that this is going to cancel out, basically, from the left and the right. Uh, I think he's going to draw from the left and right still. This VP pick is kind of inconsequential. I agree that, uh, you know, he picked her because, A, she's young, B, she's a woman, and she, C, she is absolutely loaded. She comes from tons of money, uh, and money you have, I'm, look, I'm running for state senate right now. You have to have money to be a viable candidate, uh, and that's going to shore up his his campaign in that regard. Uh, but my friends on the left will see through, they'll still, they're still concerned about the fact that he claims that vaccines cause autism, for example. I just don't see my friends on the farthest left crossing over. Yeah, well, and, and to that point as well, uh, Carly, let's let's bring you in as, as the woman on, on the panel here. Um, you know, does this now, this pick, put pressure on Donald Trump to play identity politics and choose a woman as his running mate? I mean, we saw he leaned into identity politics when he promised to nominate a woman, not just the most meritorious individual for uh, the replacement of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the Supreme Court and said, yeah, I'm going to nominate a woman against advice of people like me who said, just just go out and you know, nominate the best person who happens to be a woman. Um, do you think that he's going to go ahead and play into the identity politics here? I certainly hope not. Um, and I'll talk more about that. But first, I just want to say I'm thrilled uh, with this pick for VP because it essentially assures um, that nobody who is thinking about RFK is going to vote for him. This woman is a very progressive, far left California lawyer who has pushed for unlimited abortion, uh, she's funded the L.A. Uh, D.A. Gascon, who is terrible. And so this all but assures that if you were maybe on the fence as a Republican because you were uh, not feeling so warm towards Trump, now you're going to maybe hold your nose and do it. So there's that. I'm thrilled with this pick. Uh, I certainly hope not, Jenna. I think that, you know, Republicans should not play this game of Democrat identity politics. I think it's a zero-sum game. Um, I think that, you know, in the Trump administration, there are a lot of 
competent, smart women. I think about uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, who did a great job as the press secretary, Kellyanne Conway, who was the first woman to run a successful presidential campaign. We don't need to play identity politics as Republicans. I think it takes away from the credibility, ultimately, of the people who are serving. Uh, and I just think it's a road that we as Republicans shouldn't go down. Well, so Matt, who should uh, Trump pick then? Because now it's almost a double bind, because if he did pick somebody like, say, a Sarah Sanders, who I think would be phenomenal in this position, then he's going to uh, have the headline say, oh, he played into identity politics. So is this kind of forcing his hand now to choose a man? Or who do you actually think is the best uh, pick for Trump? You know, there have been about a dozen people who have been bandied about from Tim Scott to uh, several women, Carrie Lake being, uh, you know, the, the clown caucus uh, <laughs> segment of, uh, of this cohort. Uh, there are very qualified women, uh, Sarah Sanders, certainly. I actually think Elise Stefanik, uh, you know, one of the key roles, it's why he picked Mike Pence as vice president, was because he needs whipping support in the legislature. Elise Stefanik, as one of the leading uh, uh, heads of the conference the last couple of cycles, her stellar work. Uh, uh, running the panel with the Ivy League presidents. Uh, she's a fighter. Uh, she He doesn't get over his skis by having to reverse course and not pick a woman. She is eminently qualified as a legislator, as a political. She's certainly more moderate and a centrist than, say, a uh, CNP or uh, uh, Freedom Caucus type, which is probably helpful in the general. Uh, so I think Elise Stefanik is, is, I think, the best pick of the ones that have been bandied about. But he'll probably pick Carrie Lake yeah. because when confronted with uh, <laughs> choices, uh, he usually goes with the worst one. And since she's clearly going to lose Arizona since cinema dropped out, we should probably give her a lifeline because she, uh, you know, kisses his ass the most. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and and she just uh, she just lost her liability lawsuit and, and actually gave it away. And so, you know, since losing is what the Republican Party tends to do the most, then that would make sense. Uh, but, you know, my pick actually is Tulsi Gabbard. Um, I think she's great. I think she would appeal to moderates, independents, um, and she has that star quality that Trump absolutely likes. But, you know, we'll have to wait and see. And also the timing of when he decides to reveal his presidential running mate. But we'll be right back with more here on Jenna Ellis tonight. Well, occasionally there are things actually worth reading in the New York Times, and I know that is mind-blowing to a lot of our audience here, but it really depends on the writer and the commentary. So this article came from Ruth Graham, and this was in the New York Times this morning, and it's titled Piety and Profanity, The Raunchy Christians Are Here goes on to say, as a core faction in the Republican coalition, conservative evangelicals have long influenced the party's policy priorities, including opposition to abortion and same-sex marriage. And the influence extended to conservative culture where evangelical norms against vulgarity were rarely challenged in public. In some ways, they, re they remain intact. Most pastors don't cuss from the pulpit or at all. Mainstream conservative churches still teach their young people to save sex for marriage and avoid pornography. Yet a raunchy outsider boobs and booze ethos has elbowed its way into the conservative power class, accelerated by the rise of Donald J. Trump, the declining influence of traditional religious institutions, and a shifting media landscape increasingly dominated by the looser standards of online culture. When Mr. Trump was elected president in 2016, winning the votes of about eight in 10 white evangelicals, many observers saw it as an essentially transactional relationship. Mr. Trump, a twice divorced reality television star from New York City, had promised to appoint conservative judges and to defend Christian interests. But he rarely showed up in church and he defended a record of him bragging about grabbing women's genitals as, quote, locker room banter. He pitched himself as a protector, not a pious fellow traveler. But it's hard to remain fiercely loyal to a figure like Mr. Trump without being uh, changed by him. Eight years after Trump first secured the Republican nomination for president, it's clear that the aesthetics, the language, and the borders of public morality in evangelical America are shifting. 
So this piece in full is really worth reading, and it's worth um, a full portion and a segment of our show tonight for the exact reason that that last uh, portion of this article said, which is that it's hard to remain fiercely loyal to a figure like Trump without being changed by him. I worked for Trump for just a couple of years, and I was surrounded by a lot of the constant uh, vulgarity, the profanity, and um, just even at Mar-a-Lago, you see a lot of these pictures that come out from you know, the women that want to go there that are scantily clad, that all still call themselves somehow Christians. And this is the online sort of social media influencer where you see the kind of, you know, God, guns, and politics rhetoric. But a lot of these young women are very scantily clad. They're wearing bikinis. They're using vulgarity. They're taking God's name in vain. So the question should be, where are evangelical Christians in all of this? Now, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't support Trump. I'm openly voting for him as the GOP nominee. Why? Because no matter what we think about Trump as a person, like in 2016, he is far, far better than the alternative. And I don't care how much an individual may hate Trump, you should love America more. But that doesn't mean that we have to go along with 100% of who he is, what he does, what he stands for, or especially what the MAGA movement, in my opinion, has devolved into. It is true that even though the last uh, 50 and 60 years of the sexual revolution has advanced all of the vulgarity, the open pornography, the licentiousness, all of this into mainstream culture that used to be a segmented portion of society, it used to be um, that you were you were deviant um, if you were involved in you know a lot of this. I mean, growing up, my, my, both my parents said that hardly anyone's parents that they knew were divorced. Now you look at the statistics that it's almost half of um, of families that are divorced, and even more than that, um, there are absentee fathers. And that is attributing to this breakdown of our civil society that is built on the nuclear family. There's a reason that the family was the first institution that got ordained. So I don't think, and I'm not suggesting that all of this vulgar vulgarity and culture is attributable just to Donald Trump, but I think that this article is correct in pointing out that it's been accelerated particularly in evangelical spheres and certainly among now mainstream conservatives. I've started calling this moral gerrymandering. Basically what the current Republican Party is doing and what a lot of conservatives are doing in their attempt to support Donald Trump and support the MAGA movement have embraced a lot of standards that quite frankly are just not conservative and they're certainly not Christian. Now, can you be a conservative vote for conservative values without being a Christian? Absolutely. Uh, but mainstream conservatism used to embrace the Judeo-Christian ethos. We used to have an objective standard of moral truth that was built upon the God of the Bible, was built upon the laws of nature and of nature's God. But now that we're seeing the Republican Party go so far as to suggest with um, former chair Ronna McDaniel, even um, over the past several years, has tweeted uh, positively for things like uh, Pride Month in June and saying, you know, this is totally fine to have. Uh, the, the Lincoln Club events at Mar-a-Lago and handing out awards to people like Carrie Lake and having uh, people like Caitlyn Jenner uh, be a, a conservative commentator, in, of course, in name only, um, on Fox News. Caitlyn Jenner is not a conservative. Nothing that he, and yes, I will call him a he, I'll, I'll say Caitlyn because that's her preferred name, but fine. But Bruce Jenner is a he absolutely a he. What he stands for is not conservative at all. And so we're blending and, and actually disavowing a lot of our conservatism when the evangelical church refuses to stand up and actually criticize Trump and criticize the MAGA movement for uh, capitulating on a lot of these values. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to be prudish, that um, you know that we can't participate in civil society like regular Americans. But if you want to call me a prude, I'd rather you call me that than participate in this kind of form of licentiousness. Because what we're seeing in terms of its impact on the culture is so astounding that we are losing our moral high ground. If we concede and have this moral gerrymandering, which that term uh, basically means that we're trying as a party to self uh, self invent reality and redraw the the district boundary lines for morality and objective truth, the measurable difference between right and wrong, good and evil, moral and immoral, then we're no different than the left. 
And, you know, watching some of these people like Kimberly Guilfoyle, when she tweets all of these pictures of herself with like her boobs hanging out and um, all of these, you know, really kind of raunchy, vulgar things that, um, that not only she says, but a lot of the MAGA movement and especially a lot of, you know, the women in particular, I find that to be very offensive and utterly not conservative. So is it possible to support Trump without participating in this? Yes, absolutely. But I think the author, Ruth Graham, of this piece was wise to point out that the evangelical church needs to do better. And it is very difficult to support Trump without being affected by him. I think that the last 10 years have really affected the conservative movement in a lot of very negative ways. We can support Trump, but still call for wholesome, moral Christian values, especially heading into Easter weekend. And our power panel is back with this last topic for Thursday's roundup. Robin Byro, who is a Democrat strategist, Matt Tierman, who is a Claremont Institute fellow, and Carly Atchison, who is a GOP strategist. So this headline uh, was was just really disgusting, frankly, to read. This coming from Fox News: Virginia County declares Transgender Day of Visibility on Easter this year. Of course, it's Easter, right? A Virginia County unanimously voted to observe its Transgender Day of Visibility this year on Easter Sunday, a move some critics see as, quote, intentionally trying to offend Christians on the holiest of days. So Robin, um, you know, a as a Christian, if that's their intent, it worked. I am offended. I think they could have picked any other day. But why do we even need a day of transgender visibility? I, you know, transgender individuals all across the world uh, are murdered, for, actually, at a higher rate than anyone else. Uh, so for that, to, to honor the ones that have died uh, just because of being true to themselves. But, but look, I'm a Christian. I'm a deacon of my church. My children are both junior deacons. I am offended by this. They could have picked any other day. And I would argue, Jenna, that this actually hurts the cause because this plays right into the narrative that— uh, you know, there's an, a, a war on Christianity, uh, and that that we we put transgender individuals above all else. It hurts the cause. Gender dysphoria is a medical diagnosed condition, but this hurts the cause of actually what their intended purpose is. Yeah, well, and and Carly, I mean, you know that that stat that that Robin said that transgenders are murdered more than you know any other type. I'm not really sure that that's that's true in terms of hate crime stats, but you know transgenders are actually committing murders. Um, you know, we see, saw what happened uh, in Nashville. We've seen a lot of the uh, trans violence. So you know, why do they need a day of visibility to what you know to to celebrate a mental health issue? They don't, but this is Fairfax County in Northern Virginia. Uh, I'm from Virginia. My parents are from that area. It has been so sad to watch um, them continue. This is just par for the course. This is the same county that is currently fighting Glenn Youngkin's bathroom bill that says boys go into boys' bathrooms and girls go into girls' bathrooms. Uh, they continue to push a far left agenda that's completely out of step with Virginians. That's why, in part, Glenn Youngkin was able uh, to win the last election on the uh, on the school man the mass mandates the school closures, um, but this is just absurd. It's offensive. It's unnecessary, um, and I'm so sick of being gaslit by the left when they say that it's Republicans who are starting these culture wars. Uh, ultimately, it's the left that pokes uh, us in the eye on things, and then when we react and we fight back, all of a sudden you know, we're starting these culture wars. It's just not true. It's unnecessary. I would argue that this is hateful. Um, but again, par for the course for Fairfax County and that Northern Virginia area. So sad to see. Yeah. So Matt, I mean, isn't this the definition of hateful and bigoted, you know, exactly as, as Carly is suggesting um, when, you know, it's the left that's always saying, oh, it's the, you know, the right wing Christian extremists that are the ones that are hateful and bigoted. Yet, you know, we're, we're just sitting over here getting ready to celebrate our holiest of days, um, Easter Resurrection Sunday, and they have to go and pick that specific day. I think it is offensive to Christians. 
Oh, absolutely. And it's everything is by design. You know, politics is all about optics and details and how you message out to, to the masses. This was absolutely done intentionally on Easter. Uh, and it is par for the course, as Carly said. This is Fairfax. It is the progressive left, the most intolerant cohort in our society uh, who preaches tolerance as a uh, as a uh, religious ideal. But of course, they do not live up to it. They're at war with the bourgeois values of the middle class, of the modern moderate center that comprises America. And what better way to throw in the face of America, which is a Christian nation built on Judeo-Christian values, than to say gender is a social construct and push the issue that is so ludicrous that they are pushing because of the scale of it. How many transgender citizens are there who have this mental illness? Uh, yes, and gender dysphoria is a mental illness. It is in the, uh, you know, the, 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 the manual of psychology, but that doesn't mean it is something to be lauded as a societal virtue. It's just the opposite. It should be handled and treated as the mental illness that it is instead of celebrated. Uh, but this is what the left does, just like we look at, you know, BLM and the summer of violence. They celebrate this. They're at war with the bourgeois values that have built this country. And now, especially Easter, it's a perfect moment for them to stick a stick in the eye of just good God fearing American people. Yeah, well, Robin, I'll give you the last word on this topic. I mean, you know, we I think all of us on the panel have agreed, you know, that that transgenderism is a mental illness. And um, and yet, you know, we see that uh, that the left is trying to push this as somehow a higher percentage of the population. And they knew, um, as you mentioned, you know, they should just be free to be themselves. But at some point, you know, don't we need to, to draw the line and say, you know, no, this is unnatural. It's against the laws of nature and of nature is God. And our civil society has to stand for something. Uh, one thing I love about Republicans, though, is that they uh, adore limited government. I personally don't can live their lives however they see fit to each their own. I mean, if, if transgender individuals are experiencing this, then, the, you know, in my opinion, that's their prerogative. But don't force it down our throats. Uh, I want to go to church service on Easter with my children and not have to think about this. Yeah, well, you know, speaking of Easter Sunday, um, we have about one more minute. Let's just go around the horn. How, how, around the horn. how are you spending your Easter Sunday, Carly? Uh, we will be enjoying um, some beach time in Duck, North Carolina, and Easter also happens to be my father's 65th birthday. So we will be uh, doing a two for there. It'll be a special day in our household. That's great. Well, happy birthday to him. And Matt, what about you? Yeah. Well, I'm Jewish, so there is that uh, that that caveat. But I will probably be with your uh, so your other. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll be with your other favorite guest, most likely John Cardillo, uh, hanging out in Wellington. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so so that is a typical Easter uh, for or, or, or a typical Sunday rather, just for all of you. And uh, what about you, Robin? Uh, the kids and I are both deacons at the church on Easter Sunday, and then we're going to uh, Easter egg hunt. It'll be cute. <laughs> Excellent. That will be really cute. So, all right. Well, thank you yeah. so much to our power panel. That is all the time that we have for Jenna Ellis tonight. Uh, but I do wish you a very happy Easter Sunday. We will be back uh, with more tomorrow on Good Friday and looking forward to seeing you then. You can always reach me and my team, Jenna, at SalemNewsChannel.com. And don't forget to go and hit that subscribe button on YouTube, Rumble, anywhere you stream if you miss the live version on the Salem News Channel.